Uh, I guess you might see my desktop already. Yeah, we do. Yeah, so let me quickly introduce you. Um, so we're really glad to have uh, Manmohan Shantraika here. He is uh, currently a assistant professor in the Visual Computing Center at UCSD. And uh, before he led a research team at NEC. And he, he also got his PhD in, in 2009, I believe, in, uh, at UCSD, working with David Kriegman and Serge Bilenji. Um, and he worked on a variety of exciting and different topics, uh, probably most uh, known for his work on, on shape and material estimation. He has received uh, the 2007 Mar Prize, honorable mention, for, for a paper on, on camera calibration and the CVPR 2014 Best Paper Award for actually a single offer paper on uh, shape estimation with unknown BRDFs. And so we are very glad to have him here today and, and looking forward to his talk on, on physical motivated learning of, of shape, material, and lighting. Yeah. Thanks, Andreas. And it's great to be talking at, um, at this venue. So, um, so you can see my full screen, right? Yes, it's good. Okay, all right, great. Okay. Um, so I'm going to be talking about physically based learning for shape, material, and lighting in complex scenes. And so the motivation for this work is that mobile phones are now changing how people access information, how they conduct business, how they build connections. And for us in computer vision, their imaging capabilities are also reshaping how we interact with the world. In particular, augmented reality applications are now becoming very common with mobile phones. Okay, so uh, some of these applications require a very high degree of photorealism. For example, one might want to sh sell a shiny object on eBay or Mercari. The buyer might want to visualize how the object looks in different lighting conditions or the seller might want to upload a 3D model of challenging shapes like transparent objects with the convenience of having acquired just a few images. There can also be applications in interior design. For example, one might want to visualize how their kitchen countertop looks with a different material as you see in this edited image. Or perhaps one can rent an apartment by taking just a photograph of a room and visualize how new objects such as pieces of furniture will appear in this room. Now to achieve photorealism in such images is challenging. For example, the inserted objects must, must exhibit specular highlights or they might cast shadows on other objects in the scene. On the other hand, the objects themselves might be in shadow due to other objects in the scene, or there might be light bouncing off around different surfaces in the scene. All of these effects arise due to a complex underlying image formation process. Now, images are formed due to an interaction of shapes, which might be placed in arbitrary layouts with diverse types of material, illuminated by various natural and artificial light sources. Moreover, distant interactions such as interreflections and shadows manifest themselves as local variations in lighting. And all of these must be handled to be able to do photorealistic augmented reality. To appropriately handle such complex effects, we tackle the following problem. Given a single input image of an unconstrained scene, we wish to estimate the shape, the spatially varying material and the spatially varying lighting. Now, this is a very hard problem, even with multiple images as input. Each of these component problems of geometry, material, and lighting estimation have had extensive lines of work in computer vision. And our goal in this talk is to attempt to solve all of these challenges together. To see why this is a hard problem, let us first note that there may be no unique solution to this problem, which is also called inverse rendering in computer graphics and vision. Now, for example, suppose we have the shape and material components of a scene as shown out here. Now we'll later see what these components represent, but to insert a ball into the scene, we may edit these components as shown. So when rendered with the lighting in the scene, this inserted ball appears to be realistic and all of this is fine. However, the same input image can also have a different decomposition into these scene components. And this decomposition also describes the input image equally well. 
Now, if we try to insert the same ball into the image, it does not look realistic at all. So even though the in inverse rendering problem has ambiguous solutions, achieving a high degree of photorealism requires an accurate solution. Now, one previous set of approaches to the problem includes physics-based methods. These methods yield theoretical guarantees, but they might not generalize beyond the modeling assumptions for which they have been designed. Another set of methods is based on taking measurements of the scene. This yields a very high degree of photorealism, as you might see in Hollywood movies, but it requires expensive acquisition equipment. In contrast, we wish to develop learning-based methods, which are more practical. For example, low inference times. We can go beyond standard data-driven deep networks to physically motivated ones. And we believe that leveraging these insights from the physics of image formation leads to greater quality and insights. In particular, the networks we design incorporate properties of material, illumination, and complex light paths. They are trained based on novel photorealistic data sets that are designed to provide the relevant supervision. And the training for our networks is kept tractable with a judicious choice of representations that are compact yet effective. To summarize, in this talk, we will develop physically motivated networks to solve a canonical challenge in inverse rendering, namely to estimate the unknown geometry, complex spatially varying material, and spatially varying lighting with a high degree of photorealism in unconstrained scenes using a single or a few images. There's a brief outline of the talk. Um, I think, um, let us see whether we have enough time to hit, uh, to hit all of these parts. Um, but we will go over material estimation, shape and material estimation, uh, add in lighting to the mix. And if we have time, we will also look at complex light paths that arise with transparent objects. So at this time, I would like to advertise the principal author of these works, who is my first PhD student, Zheng Chen Li. He's now in his final year and will be looking for postdoc positions very soon. So uh, if you appreciate uh, this work, then Zheng Chen is, uh, is on the postdoc market. OK, so uh, let us start with a little bit of background. Now, uh, the first thing that we, uh, that we wish to consider is the image formation process, which is defined by the so-called rendering equation. Now, consider a point with a surface normal n. The image intensity that is observed from a certain camera position given by LO here, uh, given by omega, omega O here, is the integral of the light reflected from all the incoming directions, which are denoted by omega I. The surface geometry given by the normals um, and depth in, in other cases, the incoming light from any direction and the fraction of this incoming light which is reflecting along the camera direction are all unknowns. The bidirectional reflectance distribution function or the BRDF encodes a fraction of the light arriving from a certain direction which is reflected along the camera direction. Now, the BRDF is an intrinsic property of the material and characterizes it, its appearance. Several works in computer vision assume the BRDF to be diffuse. That is, the material reflects light uniformly in all the directions. Now, that is not the case, as we know, for many real-world materials, which might exhibit properties like gloss or specularity. In, in general, the BRDF is a function that is complex and unknown, and that's what we wish to estimate. A common way to handle opaque BRTFs is through what is called a microfacet representation. It represents the material as a combination of diffuse and specular terms. The specular term is controlled by a roughness parameter R. The lower the roughness, the more sharply specular is the material. Next, we also wish to represent the lighting. And in general, we can think of the lighting as the radiance, which is arriving at a given point from all other points in the scene. For distant lighting, this can be considered as an environment map, which is defined on the visible hemisphere. Right? So uh, like the figure that you see on the left. It is then natural to represent the lighting more compactly in terms of a spherical harmonics basis decomposition. 
the greater the order of this decomposition, that is the more the number of basis functions used, the higher is the frequency of the lighting that can be represented. For example, for, uh, for an environment map that you see out here on the left, having higher and higher order of spherical harmonics allows us to come closer and closer to the high frequency uh, representation of the environment map. Okay, with that background, let us do a bit of warm up with a material estimation example. Now, our goal here is to take an image of a near planar sample of a material and estimate the normals, the albedo, and the roughness. Our acquisition device is simply a mobile phone, which is held roughly parallel to the surface with the flash enabled. To train our network, we would need a large scale data set of ground truth materials. Now, previous data sets that have been conventionally used are either too small for training uh, deep networks or they are not spatially varying, for example, the MOLB RDF data set, or there are data sets like the open surfaces data set, which are not labeled with uh, detailed physically meaningful parameters. In contrast, we create a data set from Adobe stock material assets, which contains over 1300 types of materials with high resolution spatially varying BRDFs. Each material in the data set is represented by a micro facet BRDF model, which has three parameters, the albedo, the surface normal, and the roughness. The basic network um, that, that we would use has a shared encoder to exploit the correlations between the different BRDF parameters. We add the pixel coordinates to the input since the distribution of the light intensities is closely related to the location of the pixels. And since CNNs are spatially invariant, we need this extra signal to let the network learn how to behave differently for pixels at different locations. In addition, we introduce a differentiable rendering layer that compares the appearances of images rendered with ground truth and the predicted BRDF parameters. The rendering layer performs this comparison for several different lighting directions, basically mimicking the image formation process. This is important, for example, to characterize the difference in appearances of a material from a purely frontal versus a more oblique lighting. Now, given this rendering layer, we can supervise the network with losses defined on the BRDF components, as well as a rendering loss. The rendering layer helps to balance the influence of the different BRDF parameters on image appearance, because otherwise it is difficult to figure out how albedo, normal, and roughness should be balanced. By implementing a physical image formation process, we believe this also helps us to mitigate the domain gap to real data. So we can take a look at an example. We have an input image, which is acquired as um, uh, through a mobile phone. And that is decomposed using our network into an albedo, a normal, and a roughness. Given this decomposition, we can render it back. And if the appearance of the rendered image matches the one This is a comparison with a commercial software, uh, which is called Bitmap to Material. Now, given the input image, what you see on the left here is the ground truth as, uh, as a light source moves across the material. In the middle is our result, and on the right is the result from Bitmap to Material. And you can see in particular how the specular lobe uh, basically shatters when it hits the texture boundaries with Bitmap to Material. So here are some more results for SVBRDF estimation captured with a mobile device. We observe that even for a single image, our network is able to successfully predict the albedo normal and roughness. The relighted images look quite similar to the original inputs. In some cases where we have specular highlights, the network can even hallucinate the missing information, which has been lost due to saturation. And here are some more examples on, a different, on different types of mobile devices. And we can see that the network generalizes quite well across, uh, across different mobile phones and is able to deconstruct the, uh, the BRDF parameters quite well. Okay, so given okay, this background- Yeah. something here? Uh, yeah. Sorry, quickly interrupt. 
Um, so this on the real data, you don't have ground truth. Is that correct? Yes. Um, so, yep. so do you use this like this self supervision loss on the real data and the other losses on the synthetic data, or do you just train on synthetic data? Yeah. So, so we just train on synthetic data. Although in a later, uh, so essentially in the next part of the work, when we talk about um, shape, material, and lighting estimation, we do experiments on uh, real data sets. So in this case, we only have some real example, a few real examples that we evaluate on. Um, in, um, later, we would see experiments on, for example, the NYU data set, uh, which has a small, num uh, which has a small real uh, test set, uh, uh, sorry, training set. And in that case, we do um, fine tune with the rendering loss uh, on the uh, on real images. And and I think that is in general an interesting idea to explore. Um, for example, um, if we are doing domain adaptation from synthetic to real data, and um, if we do have a, a large amount of unlabeled real data, having such physically motivated rendering layers perhaps lead to better adaptation. So yeah, that's, I, I, I'm, that's I'm, something I'm curious about. I'm, uh, I also think so. I'm, I'm asking because I'm, I'm really surprised about the quality of your results and I'd like to get a little bit your intuition about like why, why they are so good, right? Normally synthetic to real transfer is, is really hard, right? Uh, detection, mm -hmm. segmentation performance drops significantly normally. Um, yet in this case, uh, it, it seems like it reconstructs the components, the latent factors quite nicely. So is it because of the diversity of your synthetic data set or because you took particular care that this synthetic data set is, is very close in um, spirit to the real data that you expect so that these distributions are not too far to, from each other? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think at least for this material estimation example, it's a bit of both uh, in the sense that we, uh, we do take care that the synthetic data is in some way close to the real data. For example, the acquisition condition is defined to be this mobile phone with a flashlight. Mm -hmm. And that we found to be, to make a big difference between, for example, having that acquisition condition versus general environment maps. Um, so in the paper, we have these comparisons between the flashlight versus environment maps, and it's a lot better to use a data set with flash. So having this dominant flashlight really helps to constrain the acquisition setup for the case of material estimation. Um, later, when we work on the more general, uh, when we look at the more general inverse rendering problems, um, for example, in indoor rooms, there we do have to work with larger data sets with more variations uh, in the scenes. And there, of course, we can't be constrained in, in our acquisition setup, as in it is uh, just uh, general conditions. Um, and having the right representations, having the um, having a physically motivated rendering layer really matters uh, in those scenarios. Um, now, having said that, I'll also say that uh, if we look at performances on the um, so, especially when we when we look at subsequent problems that are solving multiple of these problems together. Um, if we do have real data for training on individual tasks like depth estimation, normal estimation, and so on, it leads to better quantitative performances. So I think the rendering layer overall helps to make sure that our components are being estimated in a way that they can be rendered back to realistic images quite well, um, but nothing beats having the real data for individual components for supervision. Thanks. Okay, are there any other questions? All right, so if not, let's move to um, the um, a second quick part on shape and material estimation. Okay, so now we want to generalize our problem a little bit where uh, in the previous part, we were looking at these flat material samples. Now we want to look at images of objects which could, which could have an arbitrary shape. Our goal is again to have an acquisition, which is through a single mobile phone image, have a physically motivated network that gives us a decomposition into the material parameters given by albedo and roughness and the shape parameters given by the surface normal and the depth. 
And our goal is to be able to do this decomposition well enough that we can solve problems like relighting or novel view synthesis using our estimates. Okay, so now since we must learn to deal with arbitrary shapes, we need an appropriate data set. And we, uh, we first tried using shape data sets like ShapeNet, but then we wish to avoid categorical biases um, because at test time, we expect our shapes to basically be arbitrary random shapes. So we generate random synthetic shapes. We start with some um, canonical basis shapes. Uh, we deform them with a random height map and then we combine them with random rotations and translations, which leads to um, which leads to a set of random synthetic shapes. We map our data set of materials on these random shapes, and um, these can be rendered out to produce the images which form our training data set. Okay, so we may now again use an encoder decoder structure as before to predict the shape and the SVB or DF components. And um, now, since we are dealing with uh, uh, dealing with a shape, we also need to have some idea of the lighting, and we can predict a spherical harmonic lighting representation for the environment map. Okay, so given these outputs, we can now repeat the previous idea of having a rendering layer to compute an image using the estimated shape and the BRDF. But if we compare this shape to the input image, we observe that there are differences. Um, and for example, the rendered image is darker than the original image in the regions indicated by these arrows. And of course, this is due to the fact that global illumination is not handled by a direct rendering layer as before. Now, we initially considered having an in-network global illumination re rendering during training, but found it to be time consuming. So we instead proposed to use CNNs to approximate global illumination. And this has the advantage of being differentiable as well as fast to evaluate. Specifically, since our data set contains supervision for individual bounces of interreflection, we devise a network module to predict these subsequent bounces of interreflection. Right. So this is only an approximation to the true glo global illumination process, but we found that this works well enough and it is fast for both training and inference. Okay, so these synthetic examples then illustrate the network outputs. We observe that our bounce predictions match the ground truth uh, quite well. Note that we are not predicting the invisible surfaces out here but their contributions are still captured in our global illumination since they are baked into our training data set. So just like before, having this GI rendering layer allows the earlier benefits of learning to weigh how the different shape and BRDF components must combine. And it also helps to mitigate the domain gap to real data. But also importantly, we can now compute a rendering error as the L2 difference between the rendered and the input images. So why is this useful? Consider the predictions of the current network on a real example. So here we can see that we get reasonable outputs, but they are still coarse. There are some artifacts. And this is understandable since such single image estimation of shape and SVBRDF is a highly challenging problem. But the GI rendering layer can allow us to iteratively refine our predictions through a cascade structure. The input to subsequent stages of the cascade are the, uh, are the predictions and the errors from the previous stages. This allows each stage of the cascade to refine the predictions by reasoning about the rendering error from the previous stage. Here we demonstrate the effectiveness of the cascade structure. So in practice, we use three stages in, in the cascade. And even though the initial estimation has some, has some artifacts, for example, in the surface normal, we can see that as the estimation goes through the different stages, we are able to recover finer and finer details. Now we show a few more applications on real data. Once we estimate the shape and the SVBRDF of, of an object, we can use them for applications such as relighting. For example, um, in this example, we have we uh, render based on the estimated albedo normal and shape under a novel complex environment map. 
And despite the complex shape of the object, which includes non-convexities and discontinuities, we observe that the specular highlights move realistically across the surface. This is another example with spatially varying PRDF. And in this case, we are rendering relighting under environment lights, on, in the right case, um, under a point light source. And again, we can see that the specular reflectance and shading on the objects uh, looks quite realistic. And here we show examples of novel view synthesis. We can see that both the specular highlights and the shading look reasonable even while rotating the object. Okay, so, um, so now we have handled shape and material. We now wish to explore shape, material, and lighting together. That is, uh, solve, the, solve for all the components of the inverse rendering um, problem. Okay, so our goal here is to take a single image of, a, let us say, a complex indoor scene and devise a physically motivated network to recover shape, spatially varying BRDF, and spatially varying lighting. We will demonstrate that our applications allow us to do high quality augmented reality applications like virtual object insertion and material editing. Now the key additional challenge in indoor scenes is spatially varying lighting. Light sources can be of diverse types such as lamps or windows and light can bounce around distant parts of the scene. So there can be complex occlusions or shadows. Moreover, the same surface can be illuminated by different lights and have different appearances, or the same light source can interact with different parts of the scene and lead to different images. One class of prior works for lighting estimation have relied on acquisition which is expensive and it is especially not suited for our learning based setup. The majority of previous works that estimate lighting or learn to estimate lighting do so for single lights or for environment lights. In contrast, our need working on indoor scenes is to predict spatially varying lighting and to be able to do so in a way that is generalizable at test time so that it, uh, it can be applied on unseen indoor rooms. So there are three key challenges that we must address for inverse rendering in indoor scenes. The first is the fact that we do need a large scale data set with per pixel ground truth lighting. And it is non-trivial to create such a data set for indoor scenes, which has all the necessary ground truth for inverse rendering. For example, it is expensive to acquire high quality geometry. We need, um, we need expensive scanners for this. Material and lighting ground truth is especially difficult to measure. Uh, for example, if we want to measure material, um, currently the ways to do that are through these big spherical gantries, which are not quite possible to carry around everywhere in a room. Or to measure lighting, we have to place mirror balls at every point in the scene. And uh, that is of course a laborious process. Moreover, the fact is that for the type of complex light transports that we hope to model and recover, it is essentially impossible to measure them. For example, bounces of interreflection uh, are hard to measure, if at all possible. Uh, you might have scattering effects due to participating media. You might have subsurface scattering and so on. So once light transport becomes involved, it is hard to acquire ground truth. And that is a motivation for us to create a photorealistic synthetic data set of indoor rooms. Now, there are plenty of data sets that exist already for indoor geometry, but all of these prior data sets do not contain high quality ground truth for material and lighting. Now, uh, previous data sets that have been associated with such geometry have used Fong BRDFs, uh, for example, to render their images, which are not realistic. So our first goal was to map these data sets to our microfacet SVBRDF representation. And this is a challenging problem, problem in itself, since materials must be mapped to their counterparts while maintaining geometric and semantic consistency with the scene. For example, we would always want to map fabrics to sofas and paints to walls and not the other way around. 
So to be able to do this, we first synthesize styleable textures from our SVBRDF textures while aligning them with object boundaries using a graph cut method. To map the materials to the given data set, we then render the diffuse textures from the original data set and from our SVBRDF data set on a planar surface. Then we can use the encoder of our material estimation network from the first part of the talk that we saw to extract features and use nearest neighbors to match the materials. So given this, we now have a way to relate the materials that exist in, the, uh, in, an, in any given data set with the materials that exist in our microfacet BRDF data set in a way that is geometrically and semantically consistent. So here we compare the same scenes rendered under a diffuse Lambertian BRDF, a Fong BRDF, and our microfacet BRDF. So we can observe that the Lambertian version does not have any specularity, while the Fong BRDF leads to strong but flat highlights. In contrast, our microfacet BRDF leads to renders that have realistic specular highlights. Now, as a side note, to create such a large scale data set, we needed to render several hundred K images um, and that can quickly become very time consuming. So we also developed an efficient GPU accelerated renderer that was 10 to 20 times faster than Mitsuba, uh, at least the older version of Mitsuba. Thus, for a similar computation time, our renderer can produce uh, much higher quality and more photorealistic images. Okay, so this already gives us a data set uh, to work with, and um, that, that was the original version that we had started with, but we encountered a new challenge along the way. The assets that we used in our original data set were artist created, and this makes them expensive. But also importantly, these assets are sometimes pr proprietary, which means that they are not available for the community to freely use and develop. So, uh, so in particular, uh, in our case, we had started working with the SunCG data set, and at some point it became unavailable because uh, there were proprietary issues uh, with the data set. So we then decided to develop a framework for creating indoor scene data sets on our own. Our goal is to allow any user with a commodity sensor or even cameras to take images of their environments and convert them to photorealistic data sets with ground truth. Now, using such sensors, one can easily obtain 3D point clouds, and the scene layout can be estimated through, for example, a floor plan that one estimates through a projection of the point clouds. We may retrieve CAD models or to the, uh, which are closest to the furniture that is detected in the point cloud and place the CAD models in the layout while optimizing for consistency with the scene. Finally, given the materials and lighting that we have, we can map them to the scene to render photorealistic images. Now, not all of these steps are currently automated. That is something on which we are currently working. But we can take existing data sets like ScanNet and convert them to synthetic versions. And these synthetic versions now have high quality ground truth material and lighting that can be used for training networks. Now, as you can see, what we aim to do here is approximate the original layout and the objects. That is our CAD models might not be exactly the same, but we want to do this in a way that the materials and lighting are consistent in whatever scene we are rendering. Now, besides this, for the same scene, we can actually obtain images with different materials and under different lighting conditions given our setup. And this can be very useful for inverse rendering applications. Okay, so next we turn to the challenge of learning to predict spatially varying lighting. Okay. So as you may recall, the lighting at any point in the scene may be influenced by all other points in its viewing hemisphere. Now, indoor scenes exhibit complex spatially varying lighting. Uh, for example, you can have high frequency effects, uh, such as very different um, 
lighting at different parts of the room. We adopt a per pixel environment map to model such uh, high frequency indoor lighting. That is, we can imagine placing a mirror ball at every point in the scene and recording the environment map at those points. The advantage of such a representation is that all global illumination effects are recorded at a point, which makes applications like object insertion very fast. However, directly predicting such a per pixel environment map is also going to be very, very expensive. So we adopt a spherical Gaussian representation to approximate per pixel lighting, which can help us to greatly reduce the number of parameters. Each spherical Gaussian lobe consists of six parameters that represent the color, the direction, and the spread of the lighting. On the contrary, most prior methods, as we saw earlier, use spherical harmonics, and uh, this turns out to be a lot more uh, expensive representation. For example, um, here we are looking at, we, we take an environment map at a particular point in the scene. In the middle, you see an approximation with 12 spherical Gaussian lobes that corresponds to 72 parameters. And on the right, we have fifth order spherical harmonics that approximately corresponds to 75 parameters. So for a similar number of parameters, we are able to have a representation of the lighting, which is far closer to the original environment map. And if we now use this um, estimated spherical Gaussian or spherical harmonic representation to insert an object into the scene, then the difference is clearly noticeable. On the left, we have the ground truth. In the middle, we have the spherical Gaussian and on the right, we have the spherical harmonic. And we can clearly see that high frequency effects like specular highlights are produced better with the spherical Gaussian representation. Okay. So um, our network architecture now is similar to what we saw previously for shape and material estimation, except the fact that it has it now needs to have a, a different subnetwork for lighting prediction and a different type type of rendering layer. So the rendering layer in this case numerically integrates the product of the SVBRDF and the spatially varying lighting over the viewing hemisphere. And given our lighting representation, this happens to be quite efficient. So um, the, the other difference with, um, with previous works or the previous works that we saw is that our lighting network is supervised with both per pixel environment maps and the ground truth spherical Gaussian parameters, which we estimate through an optimization process. And the lighting network takes the estimated um, shape and material components as well as the original image as the input. We believe that having such form of supervision with both the environment map and the spherical Gaussian parameters allows us to better preserve high frequency details. Now here we can see some comparisons uh, with ablation studies. Now we can see that without the material and geometry as the input, the predicted lighting, especially the ambient color, does not sufficiently adapt to the input scene. This is possibly due to ambiguities between the lighting and the surface reflectance. This justifies our choice of jointly reasoning about shape, material, and lighting also. We can also test lighting predictions with and without supervision for the ground truth spherical Gaussian parameters. And we can see that having the full supervision allows us to recover a, a lighting representation, which is a lot closer to ground truth with high frequency details. Okay, here are some uh, results on real scenes. Um, here we take an input shown on the top left. We estimate the albedo, depth, normals, um, roughness too, which is not shown here, as well as, a, as well as a spatially varying lighting. These components, of course, we don't have ground truth for, the, for this, but they look reasonable in most places. And they allow us to do applications like object insertion quite realistically. Here are some more examples in real indoor scenes. And um, so here I'm also showing the outputs of the individual stages of the cascade. One thing I forgot to mention is that we also have a, a, a bilateral solver as part of the network. And especially for the albedo and the depth, 
it turns out that having the bilateral solver leads to better uh, better quality of the outputs. Okay, so um, so in each case, we see that as we go through the stages of the cascade, we can get uh, more refined results for albedo, roughness, depth, and normals. We also do some quantitative analysis on existing data sets. Now, the challenge with existing real data sets is that they are not designed for the full inverse rendering setup. Um, they are designed only for specific uh, problems and prior works are also evaluating on uh, specific problems. For example, depth estimation on NYU or intrinsic decomposition on the IIW data set. So um, for, uh, for tasks like albedo estimation, that is intrinsic decomposition, we obtain results which are uh, which are quite state of the art. For tasks like depth and normal estimation, our results are not state of the art. You have uh, other methods which could be trained on larger data sets or which could be uh, trained on the NYU data set itself, which give uh, results which are better than ours. However, um, our intent is to demonstrate that we can obtain results which are competitive while solving a version of the problem which is a lot harder, where we are trying to solve for all of shape, material, and lighting together. Right. And here are some results on comparisons for object insertion. On the left is the input. Um, the second column is inserting objects at various places in the scene uh, using our method. Uh, Garen et al. is a method that also approximates uh, spatially varying lighting, but it seeks to do that in a real-time manner. So um, its representations are not that expressive. Gardner et al. estimates lighting, but as a single light source, not, uh, not a spatially varying lighting. So as you can see, um, if you are not estimating spatially varying lighting, then inserted objects look uh, basically the same at all parts of the scene, which is not quite realistic compared to ours, where depending on which part of the scene we are inserting objects in, the appearance uh, reflects whether it is sharply illuminated or in shadow. Here are some more examples uh, comparing, to, um, comparing to the same methods and also a previous method by Baron and Malik, which, is, um, uh, which, uh, which does uh, shape material and lighting estimation, but it does not estimate an SVBRDF. It only works with Lambertian scenes, uh, or it works with log shading, which is not photorealistic. We also do user studies for our lighting estimation. Um, so Garen et al. have a data set with, uh, with ground truth. So we can evaluate whether human users perceive our lighting estimation as realistic enough. So for all the methods, users are shown two images, objects inserted in a scene using ground truth or using one of these methods. So the ideal performance would be 50%. That is a method is really good if users are not able to tell it apart from a real or, or, or an image with ground truth. So uh, we observe a, a performance which is higher for our method compared to the other ones as expected. Okay, and here are some examples for material editing with a single unconstrained image as input. For example, in this scene, we take a real image and we replace the material of the kitchen countertop with a different material. And you can see that the way it reflects light, for example, is quite realistic. Here's another example where we replace the texture on the wall with a different texture. In this example too, we replace part of the texture on this wall with a different one. And you can especially see the effect of the reflection of the light on the wall is uh, obtained quite realistically. Okay, so in this video, we are showing examples of object insertion with a single unconstrained image as input. So although this is a video, there is there are no temporal constraints or smoothness that have been applied across the different frames. So each frame has been processed individually. And this gives an example of the fact that our results, um, although we are doing the spatially varying prediction, our results are actually quite consistent at um, all different points in the scene. Okay, so since we are running out of time, um, 
maybe for the next part, I'll only give a brief summary. Um, in this case, we move from a single image setup to a multi-view setup, and we want to estimate complex light paths, which would arise, for example, if we have transparent, uh, transparent shapes as input. So our setup is we take, we want to have a small number of unconstrained images acquired through a, a mobile phone. And we place a light probe in the scene to get the environment map as the input. Now, the comparison point for, for these methods is previous works uh, with, for example, based on environment matting or works that need to have very expensive setups to be able to acquire transparent shapes. Um, so previous methods, for example, might use several hundred images to acquire transparent shapes, whereas our goal is to use order of 10 images. We again work with large scale um, photorealistic synthetic data sets that we, um, that we render with the appropriate physics of the image formation. And we design representations which are physically meaningful. So uh, for example, our physically motivated network has three key components that we use a two normal geometry representation that is, we assume that uh, light paths can go through the scene, can go through the scene with two refraction events, uh, or one refraction, one reflection. We model the refraction, uh, refractive properties of the scene, and we devise efficient cost volumes that allow us to solve this multi-view problem. So our geometry representation defines the two normals on a two-bounce refractive path. Now, the interesting bit about the transparent shape problem is that because we are seeing light which is refracted through the back surface of the object, this is actually an opportunity for us to deconstruct not just the front of the object, but also the back of the object from every view. This representation allows us to implement a new in-network differentiable rendering layer. The rendering layer models the full physics of two bounds refraction and reflection through Snell's law and Fresnel equations. And for appearances that can only be modeled by two bounces, um, that, that can only be modeled by more than two bounces, our rendering layer predicts a total reflection mask. So now in particular, note that parts of the scene which are not, which fall into the reflection mask from one viewpoint might be uh, reconstructed from another viewpoint. So next, we also devise a multi-view cost volume that, uh, that essentially helps us to, to do multi-view stereo. Uh, remember our shape representation is we are dealing with normals in, for both the front and the back surfaces. And this turns out to be a lot more expensive to construct a cost volume. So we must devise an appropriate sampling for our surface normals for both the front and the back surfaces. And to do this, we rely on the statistics of the error distribution of the normals based on a visual hull initialization that we provide as input to the network. So I won't go into all the details uh, at this point. Maybe I can just quickly um, show some of the results um, that we get. So, uh, so we are doing a full 3D shape deconstruction. After the normal estimation, we also do a, a point cloud deconstruction. Um, so, uh, so in this case, uh, we are comparing this to ground truth. Um, for a few for a few shapes, we scan the ground truth by painting it with a, um, uh, with a diffuse material. So, the same scene for our estimate is rendered here under two different environment illumination. We also render the ground truth under the same environment illumination. And on the far right here, uh, we are showing the reconstructed shape and the ground truth shape. So even though these are pretty challenging inputs with a lot of complex light paths involved, we notice that we can recover a high amount of detail using as few as 10 to 12 views. Okay, so at this point, let us conclude. Um, so we looked at inverse rendering in complex scenes using a single image most of the time or a few images in the case of refractive light paths. We looked at physically motivated networks to solve this extremely ill-posed problem. We looked at representations that 
that allow us to deal with complex material with spatially varying lighting. We looked at creating large scale photorealistic data sets with high quality ground truth. We looked at rendering layers that can allow us to do better learning and reduce the domain gap. This allows us to do novel augmented reality applications such as object insertion or material editing. As next steps, we are currently working on things like being able to edit the light sources to deal with more complex light transports, for example, volumetric scattering. And we are also looking at problems that involve videos as input so that we have temporal consistency and dynamic light transports, for example, if objects move around uh, in the scene. Okay, so I would like to acknowledge the funding sources for, uh, for these works. And uh, very importantly, I'd like to acknowledge uh, my students and collaborators who, um, uh, who worked with me on these, um, and especially Zheng Chin, who is the first author on most of these papers. Okay, thank you very much, and I'll be happy to answer questions.